Welcome back to our Best Way session. This is our fourth session together. And my apologies in advance. You'll probably notice I'm dressed differently and I have a different background than other portions of this program. And the reason for that is that we failed to record the first part of our program. And so I am re-recording this information for those of you who might wish to access it. So welcome back. Some of you are making some steady progress. I'm hearing just great things. And I am, again, very excited to hear how things are going for, for many of you here. Many of you are well on your way to reaching your, um, your weight loss goals. Today, our topic is carbohydrates and sugars. Carbohydrates are a macronutrient. That is something that our body cannot make. Along with proteins and fats, we must obtain these macronutrients in our diet. Carbohydrates, you can think of them as energy. They don't build muscle or bone. They're not really stored as carbohydrates either. They are pure energy. If you eat too many of them, they are stored as fat. Here's a picture of some starch. On the left side, you see amylopectin, which is a plant starch. And on the right, you see glycogen, which is a way that your body stores some starch in the liver in very limited amounts. Here's a picture of a starch granule. This is what it would look like. Each one of those chains are chains of sugar, long chains of sugar. All carbohydrates are turned into sugar. Complex carbohydrates that are found in plants are slowly digested into sugar and simple carbohydrates more rapidly turn into sugar. Now, carbohydrates, you can think of them as being good for you, but sugar, of course, is bad for you. How do those two ideas go together? Well, we're going to talk about them. The big point is the rate at which carbohydrates are turned into sugar. You can see from the screen that uh, better about 90% of all the calories in all these different carbohydrate sources eventually turn in your body into sugar. Most of the common sugars that we think about are double sugars. Uh, sucrose, which is our common uh, table sugar, it's the kind of white sugar, or brown sugar, is called sucrose. And that's a connection of a glucose molecule to a fructose molecule. You see lactose is glucose and galactose, and maltose is two glucose molecules linked together. Now, single sugars are also converted. The fructose in your body eventually is processed to glucose. Um, by the liver, and galactose also is processed by the liver into glucose. So glucose is the final end product for the digestion of all starches, all carbohydrates. Glucose is energy. Glucose is what you measure when you prick your finger and check your blood sugar, and it is absolutely essential for life. It is the main energy source for all the cells in your brain, all of your muscle cells. In fact, every cell in your body uses glucose for energy to do its work. Now, you would think if glucose is such a great thing, why wouldn't I want more of it? I want more energy in my life. Well, there's a problem. The problem, of course, is balance in life. And our country in general is not balanced. We get way too much sugar, first of all, in what we drink. Notice all of these different, um, different things that Americans drink colas and root beers and even sweet tea, they have a lot of sugar in them. Orange soda, it's horrible for us. Notice that even grape juice is on this list. It turns out that fruit juice is not the best way to consume fruit. You want to actually eat the fruit with the fiber. When you just drink grape juice, that's 200 calories right there with a serving of grape juice. And that's the equivalent of 12 teaspoons of sugar just in one glass of grape juice. And there's a lot of health risks of these drinks that Americans drink too much of. Obesity, diabetes, tooth decay, and heart disease. All of these are increased by uh, these, all of these are increased with the increasing amounts of colas and sodas that Americans drink. And you can see the numbers there on the screen. Not only do we drink too much sugar, we also eat too much sugar in our country. Now, adolescent males are the worst at this, as you see from the screen. But on average, adults get about 22 teaspoons per day too much sugar. Here are the common sources in the United States of added sugar. We already mentioned the soft drinks, desserts and sweet snacks are the next most common, but also candies and sugars and even something that I eat a lot of, breakfast cereals and breakfast bars. These have a lot of sugar. Let's talk about how the body digests carbohydrates. These next few slides are one of the key 
uh, components of the best way program to understand. When it comes to understanding carbohydrates and fat, which we're trying to lose in this program, you need to understand these next few slides. This is, this is the main message of tonight's program. If you eat a simple sugar, think um, candy or drinking some of that grape juice or a cola or a very sugary cereal or a sugary dessert, this is what the blood sugar curve looks like. Immediately after eating, that glucose is absorbed very rapidly by your body and your blood sugar jumps way up. You can see here in this person's the blood sugar jumped up around uh, 220, 230 even. Now that, as we'll see, triggers the pancreas to pump out some insulin, and then the sugar comes down fairly rapidly as well, and a lot of people feel a sugar crash. They feel they need to eat more because they're hungry shortly after one of these simple carbohydrate meals with that spike in blood sugar. Well, what happens if you eat pasta? Most of you know, especially white pasta, if it's very well cooked, that turns into sugar fairly rapidly as well, but it's still not quite as rapid as a eating plain sugar or drinking your sugar the sugar levels go up more slowly in the body and then they also decrease more slowly. An even healthier choice would be brown rice. Now, if you eat a complex carbohydrate such as brown rice, it is metabolized very slowly and the sugar is released over several hours. This results in a blood sugar curve that's nearly flat and the sugar is used for energy in a way that very carefully matches the energy needs of your body. That's why complex carbohydrates, you can think of them as a good source of sugar and a good source of energy. So here you see the comparisons of the sugar meal, the pasta, and the brown rice. And if all this sugar is coming into our body and bringing our blood sugar levels up, what brings the blood sugar levels down and where does that sugar actually go? The short answer is insulin. Insulin brings your blood sugar levels down. It signals the liver to make fat out of that sugar. Here's a very crude diagram of how that works. On the upper left-hand corner, you see blood sugar. As you eat a meal, your blood sugar levels are going up. That signals the pancreas to produce insulin, and insulin signals the liver to take extra blood sugar out of your bloodstream and turn it into triglycerides. If you remember our lecture from last week, Triglycerides are another word for fat. It's the kind of fat that we store in our bodies. And eventually we notice that fat stored on our hips, our abdomens, our arms, and our legs. So that's how excess blood sugar becomes fat that we really don't want. Remember those three different curves. This is the key point. If we are eating simple carbohydrates that cause our blood sugar levels to spike very high for much of the day, when our blood sugar levels are too high, our body is producing fat out of that excess uh, blood sugar. Our insulin levels are elevated and that elevated insulin level tells our body it's time to store fat. If we eat that pasta meal, our fat production is much much less. And if we eat a meal of brown rice, because it is matching our energy requirements throughout the day more closely, our fat um, creation, our body doesn't create much fat, and that's good. Unless, of course, you take a second or a third helping of the brown rice, in which case, you know, all bets are off. But as long as we're eating an appropriate amount of carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, our fat creation will be minimal. This brings us to the concept of glycemic index. The glycemic index is a measure, it's a score that indicates how rapidly a food is converted into sugar. In other words, the higher the glycemic index score, the sharper that peak. And as we just learned, the more fat production. Now, glycemic index is not required on food labels, but you can easily find lists of glycemic indexes online or in books. If you have an iPhone, I'm sure you could do a Google search for glycemic index and find a glycemic index for pretty much whatever you would like to know. Now, this is especially important, of course, for diabetics, but it's also important for us in this program if we're interested in losing fat and decreasing fat production. Now, a good glycemic index is probably less than uh, 55 or so. The medium range is probably okay up to 70, but foods above 70 you have a glycemic index above 70, you really want to limit or eliminate those types of foods because they are really not going to be the healthiest for us. 
So let's look at the glycemic index. Now, simple sugar uh, that requires no digestion, such as glucose, that has a glycemic index by definition of 100. Uh, but the sucrose and table sugar, because again, there's some fructose component to it, it has a glycemic index that's a little bit less. Honey is very high. High fructose corn syrup, of course, is very high. Um, interesting, some of these other sweeteners, you might've heard of agave syrup, it actually has a very low glycemic index. And although that can be helpful for diabetics, I want to emphasize the reason agave syrup has such a low glycemic index is that it's actually just fructose. It is fructose molecules linked together, and that makes it very sweet. But all that fructose load on your liver, I wouldn't think of agave as a, as a health food. I would still use it sparingly, but it does have a lower glycemic index. A question frequently comes up about all the zero calorie sweeteners. You see all the ones that have been approved by the FDA listed on the screen. Now they have the flavor of sugar, but without the calories, and that doesn't curb the appetite, very importantly, does not curb the appetite. So are they safe? Well, at least in the short term, they're not toxic. Um, the only actual benefit that has been demonstrated for artificial sweeteners is that those who use them have fewer dental cavities compared to those who are using a lot of sugar. So there's some benefit there, but for the purpose of our program, the question of their toxicity and what they do metabolically in the body is less interesting than the fact that those who use them are more likely to be obese, have hypertension, have diabetes, have more heart attacks, and have the metabolic syndrome. So for all of these reasons, we don't recommend the wide use of artificial sweeteners or the wide use of sugar in the Best Way program. I think that it would be much healthier to get all of the energy that we need from complex carbohydrates rather than these either simple sugars or these artificial sweeteners. Well, let's look at the uh, glycemic index of some uh, starchy foods here. It turns out that cooking makes a big difference in the glycemic index of starches. You see on the top two lines there that pasta that's cooked for only five minutes has a lower glycemic index than pasta that's cooked for longer. And that kind of makes sense. As the pasta is cooked longer, it's easier to be broken down by the body. And so it's going to cause uh, the glycemic index to be higher. Notice that not all potatoes are created equal. Instant mashed potatoes are not a health food. They have an extremely high glycemic index as opposed to a baked potato, which can be considered a health food depending on what you put on top of it. Now yams and sweet potatoes, although they taste sweet, it turns out they actually have a lower glycemic index because their carbohydrates are metabolized very slowly. So yams are definitely a very healthy food that we should um, probably consume more of. Let's look at some fruits here. I mentioned already that juice is probably not the best way to get your calories. Probably ought to just eat the raw apple. You'll do better than uh, drinking the uh, apple juice. The ripeness of a fruit makes a little bit of a difference as well. The more ripe the fruit, the more easy those calories are going to be digested. And again, glycemic index is measuring how quickly the sugar is going to be absorbed and in your body, into your bloodstream. Frozen orange juice is definitely not a fairly healthy thing to eat. And watermelon, although it's very tasty, would not recommend second helpings of watermelon. Let's look at vegetables. Again, sweet corn, as you might expect, is uh, fairly high on the list here. Uh, raw carrots are, have a very low glycemic index, but as soon as you boil them, actually that glycemic index jumps up markedly. Beans and lentils, as they have a lot of fiber, fairly low on the glycemic index. Again, wouldn't recommend overcooking any of these foods, and that will ensure that the calories are absorbed more slowly in a way that matches the energy needs of your body. Turns out that most baked goods actually have a fairly high glycemic index because we use a lot of sugar in their production, uh, donuts, waffles, etc. These things have very high glycemic index. Even my banana oat and honey muffin that uh, sounds pretty healthy, well, it's still a fairly high glycemic index. Breads also have a fairly high glycemic index. Uh, we definitely don't recommend white breads. Even whole wheat flour bread has a very wide range of glycemic index. And we've tried to demonstrate why that is with the uh, bottom two uh, sections on barley bread and rye bread. It turns out that just like any, anything else in life, the more you break down those wheat kernels or barley kernels or rye kernels, the more easily and quickly it's digested by the body. So if you uh, have barley bread that is fairly coarse and has a lot of kernels in it, it has a very low glycemic index. It can be very healthy. 
but if you grind all the flour up as much as you possibly can, it's very fine flour, and uh, you cook it really well, well, now your glycemic index is a lot higher because uh, those calories are very quickly absorbed by the body. Same thing goes for rye bread. Now, cereals, many of them have an extremely high glycemic index. I was surprised to see that even grape nuts, even grape nuts, which I always thought were a very good healthy food, they have a very high glycemic index. Most cereals do in general, except for your bran cereals that have a lot of bran or fiber to slow down the absorption of the calories. Most other cereals are actually fairly, fairly uh, high glycemic index. Even cornflakes is by far and away the worst on this list. Kellogg's cornflakes is not a health food. Even quick oats has a fairly high glycemic index. You really need to get a lot of fiber with your cereal if you're going to slow down that rapid absorption of the sugar. So low glycemic index foods are important. Again, low glycemic index means that that curve of absorption of sugar by your body is very flat. It matches the energy needs of your body. Therefore, your fat production will be decreased probably to close to zero. High glycemic index foods have a very rapid spike in blood sugar, and therefore, uh, there's going to be more fat production. So for part of the Best Way program, we recommend against those high glycemic index foods. We want to focus on the healthier, low glycemic index foods. These will help you lose weight. They'll improve your sensitivity to insulin. Those who are diabetic will have much better diabetes control. It will reduce your risk of heart disease uh, by reducing your blood cholesterol levels. And importantly, because that slower absorption uh, occurs, it will reduce your feelings of hunger. It will prolong your physical endurance. And that's, again, because the energy is reduced over longer periods of time. So this is very healthy. We recommend here at Best Way that you eat less of those sugary foods. Drink no sugary drinks would be the way I would uh, phrase it. Um, even fruit juices. Just drink water. Water is very healthful for you. It's what your body needs for, for uh, liquid. And um, between your meals, make sure you're getting your eight glasses of water a day. Cut out all the coffees, teas, sodas carbonated drinks, um, alcoholic beverages, wine, and even the fruit juices. If you're here trying to lose weight in this program, you really want to cut out all those fruit juices as well. Uh, you can eat all the fruit you want though. Focus on eating the fruit, not drinking the fruit juice. For your carbohydrates, select complex carbohydrates. These will be more slowly absorbed by the body. Don't eat more than you need to get you to the next meal. And focus on not eating much at night because again, that evening meal, you're eating, if you're eating close to when you go to bed, your metabolic requirements aren't that great during the nighttime. You don't really need that much energy going through the night. So next week, we are going to look at protein. We've looked at fat. Today, we looked at carbohydrate. Next week, we will be looking at protein. So I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite um, Peter Petgrave uh, where's Peter? There's Peter um, to join me here. Um, I'm trying to add a spotlight. There's Peter. Peter, I think you have a spiritual thought for us tonight, and we appreciate you uh, appreciate you doing that. You have to unmute yourself, Peter. Sorry about that. Good evening again, everyone. And did you all know that we were created to live forever? Yes, we did. So that begs the question, why, why is it that we struggle to live to 80, 90, or even 100 years old? Okay, so we're gonna look at two stories that address this problem. And in those two stories, we are gonna look at how did it happen that we started to live short lives now and how can it be resolved? Okay, when God created this world, he placed everything for our well-being and for us to live forever. Um, we know about the eight laws of health and what they entails and everything when God was creating the, the world and each day he put at least one or two of those very important uh, health laws. For example, nu nutrition. He, he, he said, let there be fruit trees, right? And we have food that give us nutrition. Um, for example, exercise, he gave Adam exercise to do when he told him to dress the garden. Um, water, he created water. Uh, 
sunlight, he created the sun on the fourth day, which gives us a very important vitamin, which is vitamin D, temperance. Uh, we're going to deal with that a little bit later. Rest. On the seventh day, he created an entire day just for rest, right? And trust in God. We're going to talk about that later. So what really happened here that disrupt all of this? Well, there was uh, an, an angel in heaven named Lucifer who rebelled against the government of God, right? And when he rebelled, the Bible says war broke out in heaven and he was cast out. And so he came to the earth. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them specific instructions. It says all the fruits of the garden you can eat, but this one you should not eat. If you eat it, you will surely die, right? So Satan comes in the form of a serpent and contradicted what God said. He said, if you eat it, you will not die. And so Eve was wandering in the garden and she came upon the tree and the serpent convinced her that she could eat it. Now, she was not hungry. She had a whole pantry of food that she could choose from. But this one she decided to eat and that break down the trust for God. And after that, death becomes a reality. Now, how will it be resolved? We're going to go to our second story. Now, Jesus came on the scene, right? And when Jesus came on the scene, he left his carpenter shop when he became about age 30 and went into ministry. But before he went into ministry, he went into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and for 40 nights. Then come that same devil that tempted Ab Adam and Eve and tempted Jesus with the exact same temptation. It has to do with appetite, right? And so he tempted Jesus to turn stone into bread. But this time, Jesus did not fail like our foreparents did. He was victorious. And Jesus, depending on what God's word said. And Jesus said these words, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So whatever God tells us to do and the things that he created for our sustenance is very important for us to follow. <clears throat> now, it was quite interesting that all the sickness that we face today started by one person who decided to take a snack and something that they shouldn't have. That is amazing. So this tells us that appetite is a very important part of our sustenance and our longevity. And also tied to that is trust in God. Now, Jesus overcame, he conquered the devil, and we can do the same. Let me see the hands of all those who want to be victorious like Jesus on this thing called appetite. Myself too. In fact, Jesus conquered, and it says in John 10, verse 10, the thief, which is the devil, he cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's doing that with food, with our appetite. <clears throat> but Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. Let us follow Jesus. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Peter. Really appreciate that thought. It's, uh, it is an interesting idea that all the problems we're facing are due to a snack. But of course, that snack demonstrated a lack of trust in God. At this time, uh, I think Laura Lucas is here somewhere, and she's going to share a thought with us. Laura, the camera, your must be dirty there or something. <laughs> yes, I'm in a car, and there's rain happening outside. <laughs> Got it. Very interesting. Well, we're thankful you're here with us anyway. So tonight, I want to talk to you, uh, give you a few more tips about your burst training. Um, we will review a little bit of what we spoke about last week, and that was how we might increase our burst training potential. And this week, I'm going to give you some other ideas of how to also increase your burst training. So just a reminder, our goal of burst training is to hit that yellow level where we're going to five or six 
on how we perceive our exertion. It should not be maximal. It shouldn't be really, really hard or even really hard, but we are trying to get up into the hard. So we're getting out of breath and those types of things. So <clears throat> as we look at our possibilities for increasing, I want you to be sure to only choose one of these possibilities this week. So any given week, only choose one increase to your burst. Then wait a week and try for another increase in the following week. So last week we talked about how we had started with a burst of 20 to 30 seconds and we could increase that burst by two to five seconds. So we could be going 22 seconds to 35 seconds in each burst, but this week we're going to look at some other variables. We started saying that you could do three bursts a week you could add a burst to your week's session and now do four bursts in the week. And that would be very helpful to your um, aerobic capacity, to helping your cardiovascular health. So you could increase, if you happen to start with four bursts, you could increase to, to five bursts. We do ask that you give yourself at least one rest day in the week and your card reflects that. Another way that you might change your burst training is um, that you might increase the speed. Sorry, I said days, but I meant you could increase the number of bursts in the session as well. So if you started with three bursts in the session, you could increase to four, or you could increase by doing another added day of the week. Another thing is to increase your speed. If you are using the same area every time, you know the landmarks of that area and you know where you're used to being when you start a burst and where you usually are as you end the burst. So maybe your goal is to go a little faster in that burst and to pass that landmark that you usually stop at, um, but still maintain that 20 second burst, the 22 second burst. You may also change the terrain. If you have been using level ground, you may want to add a hill into your course and do the burst on the hill. Going uphill in a burst is definitely more challenging than just that flat level terrain. And finally, you might change what exercise you're doing. Perhaps some of you have just started working on standing up from the chair and sitting back down for a burst. Perhaps some of you would be interested in now trying that walking or jogging burst. Perhaps you have a bicycle or even in rainy weather like this, sometimes a stationary bicycle inside, and you could get on the bicycle and bike with bursts, or you could use a jump rope in bursts. So be creative with the type of activity and exercise that you are doing to get that burst. So again, previously we talked about increasing the length of a burst session. You may also add an extra burst into any given exercise session. So when you were doing three, you're now doing four per session. You might add a day of the week that you are doing burst training. You might increase your speed, vary your terrain, or change what exercise you're doing. But all of those are options for you to change. Choose one, only change that one this week, and come back to your group and let them know how it went for you because this is another way you can encourage other people. Remember the goal is cardiac training. You are trying to get your heart to beat faster. You should be out of breath by the end of your burst session. And when you slow your pace, your breathing, you should wait for it to return to normal before you start another burst. As you continue, you will find that your heart and lungs are improving in efficiency. Your breathing will normalize more quickly. Your heart rate will return to its resting pace faster. Keep consistent because this means that you are achieving that goal that we are looking for with better cardiovascular health. Your resting heart rate will eventually slow if you are uh, regular at the doctor's office or if you are taking your uh, blood pressure at home, you may note that your resting heart rate slows down. That's another way that shows you that you're making improvements in your health status. So celebrate that. And we look forward to talking to you again next week. Well, thank you, Laura. Really appreciate that um, expert advice about exercise there. And um, we're all at different places in our fitness. I really appreciate Laura's cautions to be careful, to make sure that 
while you are getting good exercise, you're also waiting for your heart rate to come back down to normal uh, before you start the next burst. Um, lots of opportunities to exercise can be as simple as walking or most more complicated as she is uh, um, identifying there. Well, at this time, I am going to uh, ask uh, Rachel Detweiler to join me here. And Rachel, could you unmute yourself and talk about recipes with Rachel? Okay, can you hear me? Fabulous. All right, let me make sure I've got this going here. Okay, today I am going to share a recipe with you that um, it just bears repeating. We've made this recipe so many times and if you've been with us on Best Way before, um, it's a recipe that I have shared before because it's a wonderful example of using many complex carbohydrates and it's delicious and it's so, so easy. And that's one of the things I just really love about it. So let me start and show you how this one begins. So this is a recipe that starts off with quinoa and black beans and sweet potatoes, and then some seasonings and some vegetable broth. And it's just amazingly easy. And one of the things that I love about this is Say you don't love sweet potatoes, that's okay. You can use any kind of squash that you like. So if you like zucchini, that's a good option. If you like butternut squash, that's a good option. And another wonderful thing about this is if you don't like peeling and chopping sweet potatoes or butternut squash, you can find them all over the grocery stores now already peeled and chopped in the frozen section or even in the, um, the main grocery part. Now they keep them in bags that are fresh and you can just go and grab them. So you can cut all the work out of this if you want to. The only main thing that you wanna make sure that you definitely do um, is after, if you do choose to peel sweet potatoes, you're gonna cut them up and put them in fairly small chunks, about a half of an inch. And um, the one other thing you wanna make sure is you want to, you, with it, for the quinoa, you want to make sure you rinse it very well. Quinoa has what's called saponin on it. And if you don't wash it well, it will taste like soap. And trust me, I have not done it before. I'm like, oh, it says it's triple washed, it's fine. And it's not. Wash it even if it says it's triple washed. It's disgusting if you don't get, get that off of there. So um, that's the only thing that that's a little bit of work in this. So, um, so, and the one reason we use quinoa is it's also very quick cooking. Um, it's also um, a complete protein and, uh, and, uh, and it's wonderful to use. So those two things go in there and you just literally dump them into a nine by 13 pan. So whether you have fresh or frozen, or if you decided to peel and chop yourself and then that, and then um, you add your rinsed black beans and the rest of your seasonings. And um, you can add other vegetables to this. As you can see, the ingredients that I included didn't include corn, but I added corn to this. You could add some bell peppers. You could add onions. You could add just you know anything that you, you like in that. You could put mushrooms in it if you wanted, any kind of other vegetables. And um, after you do that and add your seasonings, which you can also change out because I'm all about versatile recipes. You can leave, this one had chili powder in it. You could leave the chili powder out and make it so it's not spicy at all. You could add different um, herbs for your seasoning or even a salt-free seasoning, all-purpose seasoning. Um, and you would have a totally different dish if you wanted. And then all you have to do is put this in the oven and you bake it at 375 for about 40 minutes. And then you take um, probably about another 20 minutes of just letting it sit in the oven, generally off, and it will, it will start to uh, really rehydrate the quinoa and you, it will make all the liquid dissipate. Um, you will notice that all of the sweet potatoes and corn came to the top of the quinoa. So once you um, get it out of the oven, you're gonna need to stir it a little bit. Um, we like to serve this in a bowl sometimes. So we'll add some fresh onions, maybe some lettuce and tomatoes, or even fresh peppers if you didn't put peppers in it originally. And um, you can have kind of like a salad bowl or 
if you have leftovers, you can take them and uh, get some whole grain tortillas, put that, put this mixture in the tortillas, wrap it up and throw it in your freezer and you have a burrito for later. And it's absolutely delicious. We make these all the time. I hope you get a chance to try them and, and like them as much as we do. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Rachel. Really, uh, really appreciate that. Oops, somehow, there we go. Uh, we have a question, Rachel, do you add water? You're muted, there we go. That's a good question. Um, it's, we actually use vegetable broth. So yeah, it, I used vegetable bouillon and um, added it to water. And then you pour in about, I think it's two cups, but I'll, I'll make sure you get the recipe. <laughs> All right. Someone asked, actually, Rachel, um, are we going to have the handouts for recipes with Rachel? And I just happen to know that Rachel Detweiler has been working very hard on this. And Dr. Adams has been making it pretty with lots of pretty pictures. And so the answer is yes, eventually. But I don't think we have them quite yet there. But hopefully before this program is over, we will start posting recipes with Rachel, along with the other handouts that we have for you at, um, at SouthBaySDA.org under the Best Way program. So at this time, we're gonna be getting ready to go into our breakout groups. And I hope all of you know which breakout group you're in and you've put your number uh, in front of it. Looks like yeah, most people have every, there. Uh, everyone, except I have one name, I, I'm yeah, still not sure. I see that sure. here. So what we'll do is send everybody to breakout sessions who knows their room and then we'll, we'll figure out that exception. Reminder, this is the most important part of the program. It's nice that I gave you a medical lecture and the Dr. Adams answered some questions and you saw beautiful recipes and you learned about exercise. The most important component of this program is the accountability that you get within your small groups, the relationships that you form with others who are struggling to uh, obtain better health. And I just wanna encourage you all to um, value those friendships and that time of visiting together and talking about health. Uh, your group leaders can probably answer many questions you may have. Uh, if they can't, they can all ask me, but um, many of them are medical professionals themselves and have done this program many times before. And so I just want you all to spend time uh, getting to know each other and talking about health and potentially even getting together outside of this time for our program. Uh, feel free to get together, go shopping on shopping tours, exercise, um, share some recipes, go out to eat together. Um, we want to uh, form friendships here that are lasting, that will uh, be helpful to you in your health journey going forward. With that, uh, Rachel, if you want to send us all to our breakout rooms, and then we'll sort out some issues here. Mm -hmm.